hi everyone welcome to forgotten feminists i am so glad to see you all have joined us here today we have a great group of people to join us in conversation with the lovely anne um and as i have said in her bio is a palestinian american her mom is a convert to islam and her dad is obviously not and she's here to tell us her story of growing up in the u.s um a lot of people are surprised when they hear my story and they're like what that was in canada so um yep surprise surprise canada america <laughs> france sweden uk germany um our stories are everywhere in the world so Anne, thank you so much for joining us here today i'm happy to be here lovely lovely to see you um so let's start off with what i just mentioned there with your mom being a convert so many people are so interested in that um i have my own theories um but i want to hear your story your perspective or actually your your mom's story um can you tell me about your mom's decision to convert to Islam? Yeah, um, my mom was raised pretty traditionally. And so she grew up with a lot of siblings and um, her parents actually passed away when she was pretty young. So I believe she was 11 when her father passed away and her mom um, died of cancer when she was just turning 18. I know oh. it's, it's sad, but um, she, wanted to make sure that she was, you know, well taken care of and that her mom wouldn't, you know, would be able to pass away peacefully knowing she would be financially supported and, and taken care of. So I think that aspect really appealed to my mom and sort of the structure of Islam. And so, yeah, she ended up uh, marrying a used Christian um, and this was her first marriage and she married him. He was an alcoholic and you know, he was abusive. So she ended up leaving that marriage and met my dad. So I have two half sisters from her first marriage and they were raised Christian. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting dynamic. I didn't yeah. know that tidbit. So um, I'm curious to know, like, what did your sisters feel about your mom converting to Islam? Yeah, I think they were still pretty young when she had left that marriage they were still like under five years old she had them pretty close together and so she met my dad through my aunt who was a, our first original convert to islam so ah. even her sister um was muslim and so i guess that's where she got the idea right right so it was kind of familiar already to her and did your aunt have like a happy marriage was it a positive experience and is that what made her think like oh I'll try that this time yeah they were together mm -hmm. until you know they both passed away oh okay yeah yeah mm -hmm. so um how did your mom manage to raise you Muslim and your sisters Christian? How did that happen? Were you guys all living in the same house? No. So my two sisters um, were raised by their father and my mom had five kids with uh, my dad. So there were seven oh. of us all together, but five wow. of us were born Muslim. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So your mom was very busy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she said she always wanted to be a mom and wanted to be a housewife. So she was living the dream, you could say. <laughs> yeah, she got her wish. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And my dad okay, so, was originally, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask you more details. Go ahead. Tell me about your dad. Yeah, so he um, was born in Palestine and he was visiting on a student visa in America. And he was introduced to my mom through my aunt. And so that was... Mm -hmm how they met and then the five of us <laughs> came about mm. and so did your I guess this is my so did your mom see any signs in your dad like did she know that she was going to end up having to wear hijab and end up having to be um, like, or did your dad, cause this is a common thing with a lot of these mm -hmm. men that come to the West is they sort of, um, just, they look like they're really cool and <laughs> open-minded and mm -hmm. liberal and everything. And then with age, they become more and more 
religious. And then it sort of becomes a shock sometimes to the women that they're with. Like that actually happened to my aunt, um, who's for, who's German. And she married my uncle Muhammad, who they had like a perfectly normal marriage for like 30 years. He never asked her to convert. Everything was fine. And then suddenly he like turns into bin Laden and moves into living with the mo- in the mosque and tells her, you need to convert or we're going to, or I'm going to leave you. And she was like, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for her. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. She's awesome. Um, yeah. I don't that think that was quite my often. mom's experience. No, I think, um, yeah, she was looking into Islam, you know, before she met my dad. And so that was an ongoing conversation between her and my aunt. Um, she didn't necessarily cover when she met my dad. It wasn't until um, my brother was born that she started to wear the hijab. And I think she really adopted Islam maybe more than my dad did. You know, she was mm. very determined to show her commitment to Islam. Yeah, that's why I call my mom a born again Muslim. Those The born agains are the ones that are trying to prove themselves, yeah. you know, like converts um, mm-hmm. almost overdo it sometimes. Cause they have to overcompensate, you know, right. to prove their Muslimness. Yeah. That's a really good point. I think yeah. in the best example of that is, um, I went to Islamic school for just kindergarten. And so I was five years old and when nine 11 happened and the school itself, um, started to get, you know, like just the public standing outside the school. I don't want to call them protesters, but we were just, we were being harassed in public. So on our way home from school, someone had threw like a, a brick into our car window. Like, Oh, you're kidding. Go back what state country. do you live in? Uh, New Jersey. Oh. Yeah. So that happened and there was a lot of like public um, backlash. And so we would be at traffic stops and you know, my mom would be fighting with the person in the next car. Um, we would get, you know, told to go back to our country that we didn't belong here, like being called terrorists, things like that. Um, but I remember me and my brothers and sisters in the, the backseat of the car and the glass all over the floor and, you know, oh. just being very, very afraid of what was going on. And I think my mom really feared that scenario. And so she decided to withdraw us from school. And we ended up being homeschooled because of that. Oh, I see. That yeah. is horrific. That that is terrible. I can't even imagine sitting in the car and having a brick come through the window. Like that's a that's a real traumatic experience and I can yeah. understand your mom being terrified and feeling like she needs to to protect her children and and keep them at home. Um yeah. it my did- aunt actually sorry, she was um going to tell her to take off the hijab and she tried to convince my mom, you know, like it wasn't safe. You need to take it off. You need to do the same with the girls. And my mom wouldn't listen. And she was so determined, so indoctrinated into those beliefs that she was willing to, you know, risk the safety and go to the extremes of withdrawing us from the public, you know, homeschooling us, keeping us isolated in order to protect her, you know, commitment to the religion. That's how determined she was. Yeah, because I I was thinking like if you feel that the Islamic school is unsafe at the moment because there is a lot of you know anti-Muslim rhetoric and straight up violence and hate, um, mm-hmm. then g- going to a public school was not an option. Like she just went right. straight to like keep them at home because yeah. Why do you think she didn't choose to send you to a public school? I think no matter where we were and throughout the years, I experienced that firsthand too, that there was no getting away from the public sentiment of, you know, you're Muslim, you're responsible, you did this. And so I think that and the need to control, you know, she wanted to have kids so badly. She here, she had seven and how was she going to keep them safe? Like, I guess her, her first option was to keep them really close by. And so homeschooling was the idea she knew another Muslim family that homeschooled. So I think it was very easy for her to transition. She wrote a letter to the board of education and it it was as simple as that, you know, the following week we were doing school at home. So you mentioned that your aunt was saying that, um, 
you should take the hijab off the girls. You weren't wearing hijab in kindergarten, were you? Not full time, but the Islamic school, you had to wear hijab. Right. Even, you know, all grades had to wear it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That was the same in the Islamic schools that I taught in as well. Yeah, yeah they even had us like fasting during Ramadan in yeah. Islamic school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the kid that brings their lunch is ostracized. The kid that whose parents right. care about them and is like, no, my <laughs> child will eat. <laughs> They're almost embarrassed to have food um, because it's like peer pressure, right? Yeah. Um, so tell me about homeschooling. I know this wasn't in our questions, but now I'm curious <laughs> as an educator. Um, yeah. When you say she wrote a letter to the to the Ministry of Education and then just started homeschooling you, because I had a similar experience, Anne. I was I was sent to Islamic schools in the mosque where it was like zero regulation, no curriculum, absolute bullshit. Like the 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 edu education was simply indoctrination. Um, so I'm wondering, was there a organized curriculum for you were you getting like like proper education or was what was the homeschooling experience like yeah that's a really good question because I think I felt that sense of you know chaos and not you know really structured curriculum I think there is a lot of pros and cons to homeschooling but as far as it, the education itself at first it was very you know rigorous very like intentional my mom had outlines and we would do spelling bees across the dining room table and it was just me and you know my my siblings so during that experience i think when we were younger it was very structured and she could only keep that up for so long and as the years went on it was less and less like i did a workbook you know i did a page in the workbook today i don't have school for the rest of the day but i was mm -hmm. also going to school islamic school so the neighborhood or community i grew up in was Muslims and we lived right next door to the mosque. So my backyard was adjacent to the mosque next door. And all my neighbors were Arab and Muslims too. They were all Palestinian. And so that's double fold of, you know, being educated at home, being controlled at home, and going to Arabic school and learning Islamic studies and the Quran right next door. So there was no getting away from that. And in that perspective, that was my world. You know, I didn't know that there was people different than me. So if everyone was doing that, you know, of course I wanted to wear the hijab because so yes. did my neighbors. So were all my friends wearing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all you knew. You were in this little bubble of Sharia in the middle of New Jersey. So, yeah, yeah I get that because I had a... It wasn't quite as drastic. We didn't have the mosque right in our backyard, <laughs> um, but we were like, because I was going to Islamic school, we were going to the mosque every day, like, because um, that's where the school was. And so what were your Friday khutbahs like? Like, what was the Islamic school? Well, you, it, well I guess it wasn't school, but it was like Arabic and Islamic studies you did at school at, at the mosque. Yeah. And then at home, you did like your academic things. Um mm -hmm. Tell me about the information that was being shared in your mosque. Was it, uh, you know, like, was it the, the typical rhetoric that I would expect of a lot of homophobic sentiments, anti-Semitic sentiments, anti-non-Muslim sentiments, things like that? Or was it a more level-headed um, congregation? In my experience, it was mostly just the content of the Quran and stories of the prophets and things like that. We did split the day between learning Arabic and then learning Islamic studies, but it, from what I can remember, it was mostly just storytelling. I think um, a lot of it I couldn't understand because even though I could read and write Arabic, I had no idea what the actual words meant. I just knew how to read them and you know spell, but. I didn't have any concept of, you know, sitting in the mosque during Jamaat prayer and, you know, listening to it just sounds like music or just mumble jumble because uh. it's, it's all in Arabic. They don't do any English translation. Of course, mm -hmm. the men and women are separated. And so there's also like the dichotomy of being an American and in Islamic school 
and not really fitting in there because, you know, everything was a medicania. Like that's all you mm. heard as soon as you like walked in. So mm -hmm. it, it was hard to fit in there. And then when I eventually transitioned back into school. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So you, you really were stuck in between different worlds all times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because even within the, the, within the mosque and the, all of that stuff, they would be constantly being like, who's this white girl? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then outside mm -hmm. of the mosque, they'd be like, who's this with the hijab on? Right. So you're, you're, you look strange and different no matter yeah. where you are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, that's tough. Yeah. And so that um, community, it also came with, you know, the whole reputation thing. So every household was either Palestinian or Muslim or both. And if I were to go anywhere without a male guardian, whether that was like walking to the store across the street, even like playing in my backyard was a, a big deal for them to monitor, but the neighbors would encourage one another. So usually if I did, you know, try to go somewhere or if I wasn't with my brother, my dad would find out before I even got home. So there was this constant um, vigilance Policing. over. Yeah, absolutely. And that was all the girls in the community even just, you know, talking to my neighbor who was a male, I would be in trouble for. And my dad would find out when he got home from work. So it was very, it was hard, you know, to grow up in those circumstances where everything you do is monitored and watched and you don't really have any sort of outside perspective to challenge those ideas. Mm -hmm. No, that, that sounds so toxic and so claustrophobic. And that is exactly the kinds of communities where you end up finding so much honor violence <clears throat> and in some case, even honor killings and mm -hmm. the community is all involved. There's sometimes like over 50 people knew about it or were involved in it. Um, but yeah, it's always the girls that are getting the brunt of this family honor that they have right. to uphold. Yeah, we actually had like, our... Right, exactly. We had a, a plumber who had went to prison for honor, an honor killing where he murdered his wife because she had cheated on him. And she was Muslim. They were both Muslim. And yeah, that was just a normal thing that our plumber was a murderer. And that has to be like the most ironic and horrible story that I have from, you know, just people we knew in the community. And, you know, that was understood to be expected because she cheated on him so my dad would say wow. there was nothing wrong with that she shouldn't have cheated on him that's what happens when women you know go outside the bounds of the religion wow mm -hmm. so they felt perfectly safe bringing a murderer into their home with their five children because it was a justified murder so he's not a bad guy right but god forbid i wore short sleeves and then i was yeah a prostitute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. It doesn't sound at all too different from a story that I would hear from somebody who grew up in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in Saudi Arabia or in Iraq. You know what I mean? Like these, this is the same, the same structures are in place. The same policing is in place. The same mindsets are in place. The same defending of violence against women is in place. Like, it's like, it just was like a copy paste, you know, people yeah. think, oh, it's America. People are free here. You know, people could do what they want. If women are wearing hijab, it's because they like it and it's empowering. You know, nobody is willing to see the fact that it's, a, it's the same thing. And a lot of mm -hmm. people, I mean, obviously our experiences being born and raised in the West are different than people, than a woman being born and raised in any of these countries that I mentioned, because we do have options that they don't have. But when right. we're children and when we're being raised in those patriarchal, misogynist, sexist, viciously toxic systems, it's parallel. It's almost exactly the same. In some cases, yeah. it's even worse. One of my friends, actually, she's here today, um, Ines, was just sending me a message yesterday saying, in Canada, you're fighting some fights that we've already fought, at least socially, we've already won in Egypt. 
And in Canada, you guys are still, and in America, and in lots of places in Europe, um, these are fights that people here still haven't even started. And I think it goes back to what we mentioned earlier of people being overzealous and over trying to prove their Muslimness. You know, like if I was in Egypt, people don't carry their Muslimness like a fucking banner on their forehead the way they do you know in Mm -hmm. but growing up in Canada that's what we were it was just like Muslim 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 Muslim. like it was such a huge it was it was it it's all we were there was nothing else to our identity there was no personality being developed there was no thinking happening there it was just all about Islam but Mm -hmm. um when you're in an Islamic country you don't have to do that because you're already like 90% Muslim or even more. So there's nothing to, you don't have to prove yourself to anybody in the same way your mom had to like prove her Muslimness or my mom had to prove her Muslimness, you know? Yeah. So in some ways it was even worse for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, being in America, like you said, it's people don't assume that that happens because it's America those communities are often really strict. And like you said, sometimes more strict than things that are going on in other countries. But at the same time, they, there's this constant threat that they're going to lose their Muslimness if, you know, they're not adhering so strictly to the, to the religion. Yeah. So there's that constant sense of otherness and exclusivity. You know, my dad would say, your name's not Jessica. you know, know, use any like uh, white name he can think of. Um, But constantly reminding me the Kafad are, or I'm not sure what it actually translates to in English. Infidels. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That they're never going to stop until you're just like them, that you're not like them. You don't belong there. So constantly being told that I'm different. And then, you know, trying to integrate into the school system. And it was uh, a public school. So I was the only hijabi in the entire oh, school. Girl. Me too. Yeah. That and was... so that was <laughs> just the same thing, but flipped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what age did you go to a um, public school? I was, I want to say 13. I went oh, just at the end. Same of as me. Grade. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which is a tough time already, you know, oh, yeah. 13. Um, but to walk into a school, fuck. I the memory of that still just made my stomach turn. Like it's <laughs> I know it's exactly tough. What you mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was culture shock to say the least. Yeah. Here I am, you know, coming from this Muslim Arab community, and that's all I know. And seeing everyone else who looks nothing like me. And I was told like there were Muslims in the school and that was not the case. And eighth graders are, they're awful. And Mm -hmm. of course they're going to be awful to someone who is so different from them. So I was constantly, you know, bullied the entire like first year or two while I was there. And they would like cover their ears and say like, can you hear me? Because I was wearing the hijab, like it, it was awful. But that was my return to school. Oh, my God. You had no reprieve. Yeah. You had this negative, toxic policing environment at home. And then you go to school and you're being ostracized and another like being bullied and just another toxic environment. You just went from shit to shit. Yeah, exactly. I think it was then that like, I realized, you know, what those limitations were. I had like an idea because my sisters were Christian and they were different from me and they didn't cover their hair. Um, But going to school was an entirely new experience because the amount of perspectives and, you know, like just different takes on everything outside the religion showed me, gave me exposure to things that I didn't have within that community. And I held Mm -hmm. on to that. I did, you know, I wanted to take off the hijab. I wanted to conform and I wanted to fit in. And that was the exact uh, sentiment my dad would speak on when he said, you're not like them and they're not going to stop until you are. And I was given an ultimatum. I could either 
take off my hijab and um, be homeschooled or I could, or I had to keep wearing it and stay in school. And they knew how much school meant to me. And because of that outside perspective, I really valued, they knew I wouldn't choose that. So I kept wearing the hijab. Yeah. Well, do you want to be imprisoned? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> like those are your choices. Yeah. 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 Because you know that your homeschooling without hijab would also mean that if you ever tried to, they just wouldn't let you leave the house. Probably that's what it would come down to. Yeah. Right. And it's not like I could either with my American friends, I wasn't allowed to go to their houses, even, you know, if they were Muslim or if they were Arab, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere without one of my brothers or even my older sister. So everything was very structured and trying to get out of that was very difficult. My God, see, my dad is Palestinian too, but he was not the same kind of Palestinian, like not the same kind of Muslim as your dad or Ines's dad, who is here on the call. Um, her dad was a lot like yours, like just this. I didn't even, because no one in my dad's family are strict like that. You know, I know that they exist, obviously, um, but- mm -hmm. In my mind, I always had this impression that like Palestinian people were a lot more chill than Egyptians, because that was my experience with my Egyptian mm -hmm. family versus my Palestinian family. But boy, was I wrong. I've learned <laughs> <laughs> in doing this work. I'm like, there is no such thing. Like you can't ever paint a specific culture with being chill because there's the fundamentalism is always there. The extremism is always there. You know, it, it's, it's yeah. it just always comes back down to it. It's like dropping the marble in that thing, you know, like mm -hmm. always going to come straight down to the extremism in the end. That's always what's at the core of whatever Muslim majority country you're talking about. Yeah. Um. So I want to talk a little bit about your dad, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, how was he with your, with your mom and, and your sisters versus, do you have brothers? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Versus with your brothers. Like how was he raising you guys? Was he, I don't know. Was he aggressive with your mom? Was he just as strict with your brothers as he was with you and your sisters? Um, yeah. Just tell me a little bit about him. Yeah. So my dad um, came from like I said, he came from Palestine and met my mom, but he was raised when there was a lot of war happening or violence happening there. So I think he, he came to America with the perspective that the world was unsafe. His dad died when he was two years old, you know, fighting and whatever uh, was happening there. So him and your mm -hmm. mom have that connection. Perfect. Right. They're both, yeah. you know, thinking the world's not safe. We need to protect our kids. We're going to raise the Muslim and so that came with this manipulative and, you know, personality that is all about control. And I think if you take away the religion, if you take away the culture, at the end of the day, he's still a shitty person who just really yeah. wants to control and manipulate people. And Islam gave him a platform to do that. My mom yeah. enabled that. She joined him right on the same perspective. Yeah. So he, he wasn't physically aggressive with my mom. My mom you know, embrace the religion. She embraced Islam. My sister, who I'm, I'm very, very close with, she actually went to Palestine with him and they stayed for about two months. He had some deeds to take care of. They have land there. So olive trees when, probably. Yeah, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they came back, um, he had this midlife crisis, I guess, and he insisted that we needed to move to Jordan. And we were all packed up. We we're ready to go. And this was during the recession, too. So I think he was just going a little crazy with five kids at home, you know, not leaving the school um, to school for eight hours a day. And he was looking for work. And so he needed something to change. And that's where we were all packed up, ready to go. And almost overnight, it, you know, they decided we weren't going to do that. We're going to put you guys in school. So oh, that's how that went. Yeah. And then as I got acclimated, you know, to that exposure of those outside perspectives, I started to challenge things and I wanted to know why. 
So the boys were allowed to go to the store. They didn't need anyone to accompany them. Why? And, mm -hmm. and the more I did that and the more I questioned, you know, why I had to follow rules or why everything worked against me because I was born with a vagina and they weren't, you know, yep. it, it was like that. So the sexism mm -hmm. and how my dad treated the boys, they were given, you know, this unlimited freedom to do whatever they wanted. And mm -hmm. when I got my bike taken away, right, because they, they think it's going to break your hymen if you ride a bike. Yeah. And, you know, that was like the ultimate <laughs> injustice to me as a, a 12 year old who, you know, can no longer, you know, swim at the same time that the boys and are. And so everything was gender separated, everything in my neighborhood. And it all happened almost like overnight, all my female friends were just like restricted, just like that. And so the boys got to do a lot more than, than the girls. And if I challenged that, my dad did become, you know, aggressive. So he was physically abusive towards me because I challenged those ideas. So if I wanted to go out, you know, and I got very bold at the end of it. Um, when I was in school, you know, I wanted to do these things. I wanted to go to prom. I wanted to participate in field trips. I wasn't allowed mm -hmm. to do any of that. And that made me angry. And so I would talk back. I was, you know, refusing to be silent about being treated really badly. And so that, you know, would make him violent. But he wasn't that way towards my mom. And he wasn't, he didn't have to be that way with the boys because what could they do wrong? They're boys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was, um, it was almost like listening to myself talk hearing you right now like I just I felt every single emotion that was I I feel for that little Anne like I know you had that spark in you that spark that allowed you to survive and become the woman you are today and they tried so hard to put that out you know they didn't want you to be to think they didn't want you to ask why they just wanted you to just get in line, shut your mouth, put the hijab mm -hmm. on and do what you're told to do. Yep. And there's, I, I don't, I just truly believe that within each one of us, every single one of us girls being raised in those environments, that spark is there. It's, it has to be there. It's innate. Like it, it's just human. And I think for some of us, thankfully, and really miraculously, it's luck, a lot of it. And if not, honestly, for the, just the flap of a butterfly's wing somewhere, some of us, that spark doesn't go out. Or when it's extinguished, yeah. we're able to bring it back and we're able to keep pushing and keep fighting. But it is exhausting. It is so exhausting. And especially when you want your dad to be proud of you, you want your dad to love you. You want your mom to be proud of you. You know, like you want to make these people happy. You want the family life to be nice and calm, right. but you can't because you're betraying yourself. You're betraying your own happiness. Now, honestly, I, it's almost like I can remember the moment my sister decided like, that she was just going to extinguish who she is entirely and just conform, submit as per the definition of the word Islam. And she just lost herself entirely. And it was almost because she's my older sister and I saw that happen, that to me, it was this warning, like, don't do that. Don't let yourself go because that's going to be your future. So just hold on to that little bit of spark that's inside of you. Wow. That's so that a, spark that was back to parallel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you kept fanning that little spark until it became a flame for two years. Tell us about that experience. Yeah. So I think that started very early on. I think as soon as I went to school and figured out that my whole life was a lie. Um, and I started, you know, challenging those things. I think after being told the reasons I was being, you know, limited or restricted, everything 
that restricted me revolved around marriage. And so I wasn't allowed to do karate because, you know, why would I need to learn how to beat up my husband? What skill was that going to teach me? (laughs) And (laughs) I know, crazy. Things like that. Everything was about me being eligible for marriage. That's your only purpose in this world, Anne. Yeah. Your only purpose is to get married, obey your husband, make babies, and shut up. Exactly. That's the ideology. It Mm -hmm. was, you know, from the time that I'm born, you know, they knew they had a daughter. That's all they needed to know, to know that I was going to be raised Muslim. I was going to marry an Arab Muslim man, and I was going to have babies. That was it. So all the years in between being passed off to another man and you know, being born that that's what it's about. So I, I was really frustrated by that, you know, reputation being valued over me as a human being. And then arranged marriages kept coming up. So I was Mm -hmm. able to keep that at bay because I was in school. So when my second or third cousins would call and ask for my hand in marriage over WhatsApp, um, you know, (laughs) I, you know, would say I'm, I'm in school, I need to finish school before I can get married. And, you know, my dad was starting to have meetings with potential men asking for my hand in marriage and things like that. And that really scared me. So I think I was annoyed that I couldn't be myself, I couldn't express myself, I couldn't think for myself or make my own decisions. And it was for what to, to marry someone I barely knew. That wasn't it for me. So (laughs) I think fighting against that, and like you said, it was exhausting, and that really took a toll on me. My sister was already in the process of an arranged marriage, and Mm -hmm. like I said, I was really close to her, so she was leaving, and that kind of contributed to that sense of, how am I going to get out of here? I'm graduating, you know, high school in a year. That was my excuse for not having to get married. And my sister's leaving, like, what's left for me here? Like, nothing could get worse than this. So the more that I challenge those, you know, ideologies, the more the physical, mental, emotional abuse escalated between me and my dad to the point that, you know, if I tried to leave, he would be standing in the door. If I, you know, called someone for help to come get me, he would snap my phone in half and you know, there was no escape. I could not leave the house. I couldn't walk to the store. So really that mental and physical isolation contributed to a depression that I fell into. And at that point, I had attempted suicide by overdosing. And then I was institutionalized for about two weeks. And at that point, you know, my mom came to visit me. The compromise was I could take off my hijab. That was the only thing that came out of that entire experience. But my mom came to visit me with my sister and she told me that it was so shameful for her to look at me because I was not wearing a hijab. So she wouldn't look at me. She wouldn't talk to me. And, you know, here I am at the lowest point in my life. And again, the religion, my reputation is being put before me as a person me as her daughter. And that's the way it was always going to be. And because you recognized that that's the way it was going to be, and you knew that there was really no point. Actually, I have to take a moment to say, I'm really proud of you for recognizing that so early on. Because I didn't, I took it so much further. I was almost 30 before I finally got the fucking memo that there's no point. You will never satisfy this Islamic demand of your perfect little Muslim girlness. Doesn't matter what you do. Marry who they tell you to marry. Let him rape you. Let him beat you. Let him put a niqab on you make a baby for him, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You will never be worthy as a human being because you never were. They never valued you as an individual. Like you just said, it's about like your your daughter is in front of you 
near like just escaped death and you're talking about a hijab you're talking about a piece of cloth right now like I have two daughters Mm -hmm. and I just can't you know I can imagine it because of my own mom and that's what she would have said without a doubt um but it's like these women had to suppress their humanity somehow they had to suppress their normal natural motherhood instincts in order to put the religion above their kids. Yeah. And so you recognized at this age, um, you're about 17 at this point, 16, 17. And Mm -hmm. you, so you recognize you're at the darkest point in your life and you realize there's no way I'm going to get out of here alive. Yeah. And so tell me about what you did at that point. After the hospital and that incident, you know, I narrowly escaped it. I did attempt to take my own life. And when that didn't work out, I got to take off my hijab. And you know what? That was just enough to get me where I needed to be mentally. You know, I remember walking out of the hospital and feeling the wind in my hair. And that sounds so corny, but... Oh, it, but yeah, it was, you know, a life changing experience, you know, to be able to color my hair and maybe do my hair the way I want it to. Even when I was wearing the hijab, I would wear these obnoxious flowers in it just because I wanted to be different. I wanted to express myself. So getting to go to school after that and, you know, finally wearing something that wasn't a symbol of a religion I didn't follow that felt so liberating to me. It, it really reminded me of <laughs> your story. And I, I resonated with a, a lot of that, you know, that moment that you left your hijab in the backseat of the car and, <laughs> you know, your mom still got in the car and, you know, it meant a lot to hear that from someone because for so long, I didn't know that there were other people in the world, you know, that had an experience like mine. And I felt selfish, you know, for being an American and choosing to leave the religion and all of that. So I'm glad I found an experience that resonated and that there is a community out there of ex-Muslims like that exists. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That, that is in, that is a, by design, that emotional blackmail to make you feel guilty, to make you feel selfish, because that is, that is because you were taught that your life doesn't belong to you. You're not entitled to your happiness. You're not entitled to your autonomy. You're not even entitled to decide what to put on your own body. Like to even get that little bit of freedom. The reason why it made such a big difference is because it was your first taste of autonomy. It was your first taste of becoming. And that was your first step into finally becoming a human being before that you were just a thing. You were a commodity And because you were a thing and a commodity, that's why you would be, you would feel that you were being selfish to think of yourself as an individual, right? Because that's what they taught you. But now you recognize that that's called self-love. That's not called selfish. Like you are entitled to happiness. You are entitled to autonomy, but they just work so hard to make you think that you're not and to make you yeah. think that your purpose is to uphold the family honor and bullshit like mm-hmm. that, not to be a person, not to be an individual, but to constantly just be like attached to your dad, taking care of that family honor or to your husband and that family honor. And you were just about to get switched, you know, like the, the ownership papers were just about to get passed over to your new owner. Mm -hmm. So you really were in a, in a life or death situation, obviously, literally, as well as, as um, figuratively on the horizon. Um, And so you got yourself out. I did. And I, I built myself up from there. So as soon as I got out of the hospital, that experience with my mom made me understand that there was nothing that I was going to be able to do to change her mind. And it wasn't worth it. And I didn't have to. The best thing I could do for myself in that situation 
was to take myself out of the equation. I didn't have to be part of it and I didn't have to change their mind. You know, I can, I can choose myself and I can get out of here. And I was very confident that I was going to make that happen no matter what it took. You know, my dad used to say, you live in La La Land and it's in your head and all of this stuff, but La La Land is pretty freaking great. Like <laughs> it's, you know, a real thing and the grass is greener on the other side. I think after that point, I, you know, threw all my anger with that, the whole upbringing into what I needed to do to get out of there. And so I was looking for a job. And of course, it had to be, you know, academically related or a respected profession in order for my dad to agree to let me work. I wanted to, um, I applied for like an, a pharmacy job and my dad didn't want me to be a cashier because he would say, what do you need to be behind the counter for? So someone can come in and say, you have a nice ass or nice eyes, stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, the second I walk out the door, you know, my virginity is at risk. So that's like a reputational thing. So it was like all of those little barriers that I had to get past in order to at least get a job. And then from there I could save and then I could get a car. And I brought like a really cheap rundown car to get me from point A to point B. And it had to be in my name because he would report it stolen if I, uh, you know, would be somewhere that he didn't want me to be. Or if I tried to leave, he could do that. He has the, the control. Yeah. And he would make those threats. So <laughs> I made sure everything was in my name. You know, I used applying for college as an excuse to get all of my paperwork and file my own taxes for the first time. And, you know, I got a phone plan in my own name and I was going to do this. And yeah. I um, would tell him I'm going to work and I met up with a realtor and eventually I had enough money to get, you know, a really cheap studio apartment. And I did that. And then <laughs> it was about the the slow move. So I had paper plates and toothbrushes and you name it in my trunk for months at a time. And I was slowly, slowly moving my stuff out of the house. And then it was just a matter of waiting for the right time. So my dad would work away for the weekend in another state. And uh, my mom would go out with my aunts on Saturday nights. So it was go time. And I packed up <laughs> all of my stuff <laughs> in a couple garbage bags and I threw them into my car. And you know, I left, I left them a note and it said not to look for me, but I wasn't coming back and that I choose me <sighs> and I left. Yeah. And it really, you know, sunk in when I was in my apartment, had no furniture, just holding the keys in my hands. Like, I can't believe I'm here and I'm 18. I don't know anything, but I'm here. And it, it sunk in that, you know, I was losing relationships. I was losing my sister. Most of all, I didn't know, you know, I would have a point where I reconnected with my my sister, my siblings, my mom, and everything had to be hidden and everything had to be really secret because he would make threats like, you know, over my dead body, you're leaving or things like that. So I was really, really afraid that he was going to find out where I was and I couldn't tell anyone. My sister knew, but I, I wouldn't tell my brothers, my friends, nothing. And so I, I was afraid that that was going to happen. And that night when they got back home and I got voicemail after voicemail of, you know, being told that they were going to find me, that I was, you know, I will kill you. My mom, you know, screaming and cursing me out. My dad would say a dog would be more loyal than you. You know, I had five kids. Now I have four. It's no problem that he was going to go to the Arab newspaper. That's not a thing. He said it was a thing. Um, and, you know, announced that I was no longer his daughter. I was like, great, let's do that. But, you know, I, at that point, that was the last time I ever saw my dad that night that I, I left. And I still have not talked to him till this day. And that's seven years later. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. 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 I, I, I don't know. I think that you won't really get how amazing you are until you have 
or if you ever have a daughter of your own and she's about 17, 18. And if you just imagine, cause it's hard for you to conceptualize it when you're the one that went through it, but yeah. it, it really, I mean, that story of survival that you just shared with us right now, like that, that is so inspiring. Um, I'm so proud of you. I'm so impressed by you. I'm in awe of you. I, I can't believe that you did it at such a young age. Like at that age, I was still so petrified. And like you said, you know, nothing, which again is by design, all of those years of homeschooling or all those years of Islamic school, or all of those years of keeping your world really, really small that's by design. And so it's harder for you to stand on your own two feet and to escape and to become, to choose me. I love that you said that. <laughs> I choose me. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, and so you haven't had any contact with your dad since, but you mentioned that you reconnected with your mom. And I saw some of those um, pictures on your social media account and with your with your sisters, what, is it just your sisters from the first marriage or your sister from, from the, your same dad as well? Both. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So it, it took a while for my mom to, to come around, you know, a lot of that. I think when you're coming out of that for so long, you're operating in survival mode that you really yeah. don't have time to consider relationships or losses mm -hmm. everything went into you know how am I going to put myself through school I, I went full-time at work and you know taking classes I I was nervous about going grocery shopping and what food was was I going to stock my new apartment with and getting furniture so it was a lot of growth in a really short period of time but I was starting to get the hang of learning how to take care of myself and you know doing the things that I felt I couldn't do in that house or, you know, just being myself in a way that I wasn't allowed to living with them. And so after about a year of that, <laughs> um, my mom had reached out and pretty much had a change of heart and we reconnected and we have a good relationship now. We're still very distant, you know, physically. And, you know, we talk here and there, but she's come to accept more and more you know, my life being different in the same way that I understood she wasn't going to change her mind about Islam. So I think it did eventually sink in, you know, everything she witnessed growing up and refused to intervene when it came to my dad and complied in all mm -hmm. those ways. I think, you know, she took, um, she took that and wanted to re- you know, she wanted to change our relationship and we did. And so we're on good terms now. That's amazing. I mean, it's amazing first and foremost for a mom to accept that she failed in protecting her daughter and to take responsibility for that. Just any mom. Um, yeah. But for a, for a Muslim mother to reach out and to still want to have a relationship with her daughter, even though she knows that her daughter wants nothing to do with the religion that she holds, that your mom holds so dear is huge. I mean, the bar is low. <laughs> so yeah. like you mentioned, you know, most, most parents want to kill their kid for, for this crime, you know? Mm -hmm. So for there to be a mom who's willing to say, you know, which is what they're supposed to do, but they freaking never do because they also at the same, that, that means you guys, for those of you who um, don't speak Arabic, that means you have your religion and I have mine, um, which is taught alongside of, if you leave Islam, you have three days to repent or you'll be executed. So there's a bit of a contradiction there. Um but anyway, your mom was really embraced that and said, you know what, you're my daughter and I love you. And it only took her a year. That's pretty impressive. Um, it's been almost 20 years and my mom still wants me dead. So I think it's great that your mom has allowed her humanity to override her indoctrination. Yeah. 
I, I think it's sunk in that my mom is getting older. My sister had, you know, gotten married and she has a kid now and she was alone with the boys and my dad. And so I think that is what made uh-huh. her want to, you know, reconnect. Yeah. Oh, that'll do and it. I'm, I'm okay <laughs> with that. As long as, you know, we yeah. can coexist peacefully. I'm okay with that. Yeah. That's all we ever wanted is just to yeah. coexist peacefully. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I had a question here that I was going to ask you only because a lot of people ask me this and um, I think I already know the answer, but people who are sort of in that precarious point that you were in where it's like, if I do this, not only is it going to be so difficult as far as you describe like the logistics, you know, renting a place, knowing what food to buy, you know, understanding the basics of how to be an adult all by yourself without anybody to guide you through all of those things. That's one set of problems, but then there's also the emotional side of things, right? The guilt, the losing connection with your family, the knowing that your parents hate you and that your dad just threatened to kill you and all of that emotional Mm -hmm. stuff as well. Um, And so a lot of people are at that precipice and they feel like it's that mountain is just too, I can't uh, forget it. It's too much. Now, obviously you decided to do it. You climbed that mountain step by step and you made it to the top. And my question to you now was, is, was it all worth it? Was everything that you went through worth it so that you could have your freedom and happiness today? hundred percent. It was. Yeah. I think you don't really know what you're capable of until it's your only choice. And I think if I was already at, you know, such a low point in my life where I was considering, you know, to just to opt out, what was the harm in trying to get free? You know, I had to at least try and my try was good enough. And I think, you know, if you have any inkling of hope or, determination to get yourself out of that situation it is possible it's not la la land that it can be a reality you know you're more capable than than you think when it comes down to it it might seem impossible but if you're angry enough and you know if you're desperate enough i think life finds a way beautiful thank you thank you for sharing that because a lot of people who watch these forgotten feminists are feeling that way, are feeling like, is it going to be worth it? Can I do this? Um, Am I going to regret it? But I agree with you completely. I would, I would do it all over again. I would go back in time and do it all over again without a shadow of a doubt. Oh my goodness, Anne, you have a huge group here today. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So uh, the, there's like, 35 messages in the chat, which I haven't read because I've been too busy listening to you. Um, But I'm just reading the last one from Aaliyah, who says, I just had a good cry while hearing Anne. Aaliyah is my very first forgotten feminist. She's the woman who inspired this whole thing. Um, So yeah, Aaliyah, do you want to unmute yourself and and, um, say something to Anne? Okay, she may not be able to unmute herself then, but she's messaging that so many emotions came like a wave. Aaliyah, like us, because she's born and raised in America as well. Um, So I think we share like a very, you know, that perspective, that experience. Um, But she was unfortunately forced into a marriage and uh, taken to Pakistan. So that little precipice there, you know, there's so many girls that I talk to these days. Thank goodness for the internet. Let let me just say that for like a gajillion reasons. Um, But first of all, when you were going through what you were going through, you had Google, which is like better than a lot, (laughs) way better. (laughs) Cause you could just be like, help Google. Um, Whereas I didn't have that when I was going through my whole thing. Um, But thank goodness for the internet now, because I get so many messages from girls thinking that if they marry this guy, it will get them out of their horrible home life. 
And that's exactly what I was thinking. And that's exactly what Aaliyah was thinking. And that's exactly what so many girls were thinking. My home life is so horrible and so treacherous and it couldn't be any worse. So I'll marry some guy to get me out of here. And I mean, out of the frying pan into the fire is just like the most, it, it, it's a benign, like it doesn't even describe how much more difficult it will be for you if you do escape to marry some other guy, some uh, to, to go from one horrible controlling situation to an even more horrible and even more controlling situation, which is hard to imagine at the time, um, but it right. does get worse. It's just a, a transfer of the same situation, maybe just a different environment. But it's yeah, more and of now a you mental have... prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now what happened with me was now they have an ally. Now they have another person that's also going to help to control me. Right. And then the, I love my daughter. Of course, she is my world and she's the one who saved me. But also having a child really early is also a part of that too, right? Because mm -hmm. you want to protect your kid and you want to keep your kids safe. And, and how are you going to do that if you just have a high school education and you're on your own and no family right. and no support. So it's another way of keeping you um, controlled. Um, Lois uh, is writing for us here. Lois is one of my most loyal forgotten feminist. <laughs> um, so she's saying here that as a teenager, oh, so Nate Phelps, who was leaving the Westboro Baptist Church, um, told the story that's similar to yours, Anne, in that he bought an old car and he hid it. And on midnight of his 18th birthday, he snuck out and never went back. So good for him. Yeah, that's yeah. Can't underestimate how tough that is to do. Okay, a lot of people are writing in the chat, but nobody's unmuting themselves and talking with us. I'm not going to read any more messages. If you want your if you want to say something to, uh, <laughs> if you want to say something to Anne, you have to unmute yourself. Anya, like, yes, my dear. Yes, I'd like to say something. And listen, um, I've been shutting my video because I am so overwhelmed by emotions, and so many things are hitting me, including your tone of voice. Yeah. You're talking about the horrific experiences in a matter of fact manner. And it hits me even more. And I was picturing this girl, you, going to school every freaking day. I imagine your heart would go into this little lump before you step out of the door and you go to school and you will be mocked or bullied. And then when you go home, there is no comfort there either. How do we survive this? And then, so my first thing I want to tell you is that you're here in a blanket of our love and admiration. You really are. Trust me, we all feel it and we're all with you. Ah, oh, it's just unbearable. Something Yasmin said, and I don't mean to take away the emotion, but Yasmin said something that always hits me when I hear the stories, that it goes against our basic humanity. It's so natural. It, it's like mm -hmm. you don't have to teach anybody to love your child. The child is born, and there's nothing but love for this child in your heart. And all those instincts are twisted into this incredible brutality by ideas. And that made me think of Sam Harris, who talks all the time about the power of ideas, how important it is, Yasmin, what you do to fight those ideas that twist our basic humanity into the nuts so that mother would be driven to do what she did, and in your case, our father, to do what he did in your case. But what a glorious hymn to humanity you are. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So beautifully said, Anya. Thank you for sharing that. 
Anya and I, both of us, it was our daughter who saved, like having a little girl and wanting to protect her and wanting her to be happy and safe is what was the catalyst for us to get ourselves out of the situation. So I think for, um, for us, it's extra difficult to understand um, a mother who chooses some ideology above her baby girl. I can imagine that you guys are, are really strong women for putting your daughters first. And I think it's it feels very vindicating to be the adult now that I needed for that kid then. Yes. Beautiful. I'm so happy to hear that. Yes, that's another, you're so smart. It, you're recognizing <laughs> and learning things so much quicker than I did. And that's that just means that you're going to have so much less time suffering with this <laughs> trauma haunting you. So I'm, I'm really proud of you, but yes, that's something that I just very recently discovered. And that's that, that little girl who was crying and scared and sad and afraid and nobody was protecting her. Uh, I can finally be the person who protects her. You know, I can take care of that little Yasmin that nobody else took care of. And I never imagined that I'd be the one to, to, to protect myself and save myself, but there's, you know, it, it's so much more meaningful actually than having somebody else come and, and do that, you know, waiting for somebody Absolutely. else to come and protect me. It's empowering yeah. to know that it doesn't matter if anyone else is coming to help you or not, you're going to be the you one to get it. yourself out of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to find you and hug you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Aaliyah. Can I unmute myself? Hi. Hello. Hi. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I was still sitting with all of my emotions when you had pulled on me, and I still am. But um, I just wanted to say that I'm so proud of you and for um, coming here and for sharing your uh, story. You are truly inspiring. And, you know, just, just the other day, um, there, there's somebody from, from London, a moderate, very liberal Muslim man who, who, who felt very threatened by my voice, a girl <laughs> who's sitting here in the United States, just on spaces. And this is not the first time, you know, last year he also warned me to keep my mouth shut for the past two, three days, he's also been warning me, going around in spaces, you know, following me, and then telling everybody, look at her, look at her, this Aaliyah, she needs to keep her mouth shut. She's spreading all this hate, and I have, I, I have a daughter, and I have nieces, and she's, she's putting them in harm by spewing all of this, just by me sharing my story and doing what I do, raising awareness. You know what, people like you, and everybody else who speaks up, like Yasmin, Sahara, everybody, you guys inspire me, you know, more and more each day to, to continue. Conversations like this, these are so necessary. These are so crucial to have. Um, nobody is going to stop us from speaking up. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I, I questioned whether or not I, I wanted to you know, speak about my story and things like that. So that's really reassuring to me. And I'm so glad that you're here and you got something out of it and you're refusing silence and you're speaking out. I think there's something powerful in storytelling and being vulnerable and authentic. And the fact that you're a woman and you can be all of those things despite everything working against you, it says something. <laughs> Yes, and thank you, Yasmin, for um for bringing her and for for, for this whole series. Um, it's also a uh, therapeutic too, you know, uh, to be able to be in a space with uh, with others and um and kind of bond. Um, I, I know it sounds a little bit like okay, we're like bonding through our trauma, but yes, you, uh, you know, um, we're we're all here to support one another. 
Yeah, it's absolutely. We're bonding through our through our survival and our empowerment after our trauma and supporting each other in moving forward and moving, you know, upwards and onwards. And um, I'm going to echo everything that Anne said to you. And you are an incredible spirit, Aaliyah. You are, again, you're the one who inspired all of these conversations and this person who is harassing you and stalking you right now, they can't stand it. Women are supposed to be neither seen nor heard. We're not supposed to have an opinion. We're not supposed to have a voice. We're not even supposed to have a face. And so when you are an empowered woman speaking your voice, telling your story, sharing your perspective, they can't handle it. They cannot handle not having control over women. And so when he comes and stalks you, just know, like every time you see that, just feel happy, feel glad that you are pissing him off so much <laughs> that you are enraging him so much and his masculinity is being diminished so much because you are a woman and you are speaking your mind. Don't take it as something hurtful. Take it as something empowering. Like, yes, motherfucker, I am speaking up, right? Like, don't let it, don't let it hurt you. Let it empower you and just speak louder. And I know you will. I know you know this already. And I love you and I'm proud of you. And I'm so sorry that you're going through this, but this too shall pass. This is what they do. They just keep doing this and you just keep plowing forward. And I, I know that you will already. Lena. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Anne, for sharing your story. Uh, and thanks to Yasmin for giving all of us this amazing opportunity to speak up in this brilliant uh, podcast, Forgotten Feminists. Um, listening to your story and from your perspective, which is completely different from mine, was not only educational to me, but also insightful, enlightening, and inspirational. Uh, and I'm sure not only to me, but to thousands of women uh, who will be listening to this. Um, Thank you for sharing your story. I can only imagine um, going through what you uh, have gone through. And sharing your story will, will give a lot of hope to many girls who I'm sure might be going through the same thing now. Uh, just to, give, to, to tell them that there is hope. You can do it. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that you chose yourself. And so proud of you because, you know, although you were, you were raised and you grew up in this prison who is that isolated you from the society and the whole world, but yet you're like, you were able to break free at such a young age at 18. Like I, I remember myself when I was 18, I, I couldn't do any of that. So I'm so proud of you and thank you for sharing your story. Um, and thank you all. So that's all I have to say. And, and I'm happy to see Ines too in this episode. So hi Ines and thank you Yasmin for bringing all of us together. We have to stick together because we are stronger together and we can do a lot. We can change the world. Thank you all. <laughs> Go ahead Anne. Yeah, I was just going to say that that was so well said. We can definitely change the world. We can light it on fire if we wanted to. <laughs> Thank you, Lena. Sahara. Hello, beautiful souls. Hi, guys. Hi, Anne. Um, Hi. I don't even know what to say, where to start, because, yes, uh, you guys are incredible. You said a lot. And, and we are so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And your story, yes, Aliyah, like said, you know, it, it opened uh, wounds for me 
when you were escaping, when you were, when you were explaining, when you escaped, you know, or left your home, um, the abuse house, it reminds me back where I grew up in Kenya. I escaped from my family also, a young age. So it really remind me, just like you know, you have to choose for yourself. And when you said it's me, it's my life. It's just amazing. It's incredible, you know, what you have done for yourself. And the hijab, when you were also explaining the hijab, you know, the day you removed the scarf, it's not only a scarf and it's not cliche or, you know, it's, it's empowering story that is so relatable to because when I removed that shit, that crap, abuse, um, piece of shit, I call it garbage and you get mad and sure, go get mad. I know we are, Ali and I are pissing off uh, a lot of Muslim guy. I think their PB is a shrinking because they can't deal with even uh, more, even more. I think they shrink. Him. It was already shrank. So it's just shrinking every time they hear, you know, woman's voice, especially, you know, how dare you descend in, you know, they, they say, but we still continue to descend. We continue to leave and say, of course, uh, one of our favorite phrase, no, no to Momo and no to hijab and, and all the crap abuse. But removing the hijab, yes, it is, it's empowering and just feeling the fresh air, the wind through your hair. I mean, when you explained that, I was like, yeah, I did that. And it just, I can't even explain. You can't explain because we all been through, right? You, yeah. That moment is incredible moment and it's empowering. And I'm glad uh, I did it. And I'm glad you are here. And your story is inspiring a lot of girls and a lot of individuals who are in this religion, who are attracted to this cult, this, this uh, community, like, because the abuse is real, the fear is real, the abuses and the, uh, you know, even if you try to escape from your family, the community, the abuse is real. Mm -hmm. So we are proud of you again. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for sharing your story. And you are incredible, a beautiful human. And I'm so glad people like you people, Yasmin, Aliyah, and amazing souls who are here with us exist in the world today because the world is a beautiful place because you guys are in it. And yes, together we are unstoppable. So thank you and always love and peace to you guys. Thank you, Yas, for creating this platform because mainstream media will not do this because we don't fit these story. They don't want it incredible, you know, survivors because they want us to be their own victim puppet. You know, we're not going to be mm -hmm. a puppet. We're going to create our own, um, our own media and our own stories. And we're going to continue. And then we're going to keep pissing these motherfuckers and <laughs> shrinking their PBs and they can, yeah, they can just keep shrinking. So, and <laughs> you should be proud of yourself. You have done incredible job and you choose you and I'm proud of you. So thank you for being here. Thank you guys. Thank you, Yasmin, for letting me rant and no, no to Momo and F it all <laughs> and peace and love. I love her. <laughs> Fuck them all, peace and love. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know, I, know. Yeah, I adore like... her. <laughs> You, you got to yeah. kill it with the kindness. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. Just, yeah, seriously, just live your life and leave people alone. And, and I think a dog was, uh, somebody was asking in the comment, why are Muslim men are so insecure? Because like I said, they have a little, you know, PB and then it just shrinks every time they freaking hear women. I think they fearful. They know that we don't want to put up with this abuse. So I think, and also, of course, Momo, what did he do? He was also insecure and, you know, had it like a problem with his whatever shit crap, you know, uh, his little PB as well. And so it's just, it's just, we just need to continue and we are here and we're not going anywhere. And you can F yourself, all of you who are trying to silence us, but we're not going to be quiet. We're going to continue to talk. So yeah, so peace and love and F you all. And thank you again. Be quiet. Yes, I completely agree with you, Sahara. And I, I get that I'm exactly the same way. Everything is peace and love until you cross my boundary and then you can go fuck yourself. Like you, that's how it has to be. 
You have to have your boundaries and those boundaries have to be firm because that's how you protect your peace and love. That's how you protect your, um, this world that we have risked our lives to create for ourselves. We're not going to let anything, um, disrupt that balance or, or anything threaten that ever again. Aaliyah, I mean, sorry, Lois. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. And <clears throat> there's no way I can describe, I am in total awe of you and your strength and your courage. I just, uh, I, I can't, I can't explain it. There, there's one thing that I keep wondering and <clears throat> it's, you have a sister that was, that stayed and was faithful. Yasmin, you had a sister. I have an older sister who's a devout, I mean, talk about devout Christian. Mm. And even my doctor, who's an atheist, has an older sister who's a doctor, but a devout Catholic. You don't understand, what's the difference? What gives some of us the determination and the, well, for you guys, the courage to get out? And our sisters are meek and mild and just don't. I, I just... I, I wish there was an explanation. And I also wonder, is there any way to reach them? Mm. I think that maybe seeing, like Yasmin said, seeing your older sister comply, someone you love become complicit, seeing that example so close and knowing I want my life to be nothing like that and choosing the opposite. I don't want to say it's a self-sacrificing sort of thing because you know, maybe that just resonates with them in a different way than it does with us. But maybe without that, we wouldn't know what we wanted for ourselves mm. and that we wanted something different. And I think there mm. there is a way to reach them, you know, maybe in your own way or, you know, everyone comes from a different perspective. Yeah. But the bond I have with my sister is very close. And I don't think religion has anything to do with, with that. And I hope that you can reach your sister someday in a way that comes from a place of sisterly love instead of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the binds of the religion. Thank you. Ines, you had an older sister too, right? Who, do, do you have a parallel story? I see you nodding and I'm, I think I have a memory of you telling me that. First of all, hello to everybody. And um, uh, Anne, yeah, I was touched for sure, like any, uh, all of us. Uh, and I can feel, I can even imagine uh, Americania, the, the Palestinian slang of uh, shaming you or uh, suppressing you. I can, I can even without you saying it, I can hear it in, in my ears and my heart. I know very well when they uh, decide, the, the father, they decide to make you nothing and to suppress you up to the limit, you feel that you are breathless. I feel every single word you said or you didn't say. Uh, I'm so proud of you. Uh, really, it is it is really touching. And um, thanks, you are young. And thanks, uh, <laughs> I am 51 years old. For I know what uh, internet made between generations. And I, I know that exactly the difference. And uh, also, I, I know that nobody now there is no excuse to anyone not to understand what is the real religion, Islam or other religions. Um, what really, when you are, you have an ideology, how it can kill you and it can affect all your life aspects. I know very well, uh, Anya, thank you, because you mentioned uh, the movie Orthodox, Unorthodox. Mm. That's worth seeing. 
Um, uh, yes, I have an um, uh, elder sister, and uh, but um, there is nothing, yani, the, we have a very good relationship, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, she was always, always, I feel her. She felt me many a times. Maybe she's not outspoken um, uh, like me, but uh, she also suffered a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, yani, uh, from my father and uh, the way he dealt with her and uh, he shamed her. This is something I cannot forget and mm -hmm. I cannot forgive him for this specific i saw mm -hmm. my um, uh, she was the eldest and um, she um, uh, i believe in the eldest uh, uh, son or daughter or uh, in, because they they face it all all the bad things of the both the parents thus the eldest will take it all um and um i always felt that he was he wasn't unfair with her um and many shaming her for for many things and like that um she was a brilliant and um uh, beautiful and but he was uh, not feeling this much about her um, uh, he suppressed her a lot and suppressed the 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 um, because my father is really dictator and the narcissist. Yani and the Palestinians unfortunately have many. Uh, yes, me. <laughs> yeah, I know that now. <laughs> you will not believe the number. <laughs> I am sure and I can understand I this because uh, you, uh, she was in the society. Uh, you said all Palestinians uh, around you and like that. Iowa. And this ah, and this is specific thing of Palestinians, Jordanians, the uh, Syrians when they are uh, religious and like that. Uh, I can say Lebanese also when they are really strict because. Uh, um, um, uh, because in Lebanon also many many sects and uh, uh, from uh, the same religion has many sects and like that for, for it is really bad and always 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 the ladies will pay this pay all the price Mm -hmm. Only ladies. Yani, Nas Nasreen is answering us in the chat. She said it means sectarianism. Yes, yes. Sectarianism. So Sunni, Shia. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm so proud of you and uh, and every every one of you here. And thank you, Yasmin. Yani, thank you because you keep us. Uh, gathering and uh, feeling each other and uh, hearing the stories from many 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 around the world so we we know that's mm -hmm. th this something we have to fight because yani yesterday also on facebook and uh, and i um one of um um friends on facebook he said that uh, uh taking off hijab and hijab and how the ladies wear it is not that uh, very important to egyptian ladies but i told him i told him who are oh, you to talk about important and uh, she it is important for her no, you trust no opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you trust no opinion. Really? Yeah. yeah. What is this? Uh, uh, it is very important. I told him and I made him understand. Hijab is as a simple and see now Iranians. 
uh, ladies what they are doing and chapeau, chapeau, chapeau. This will bring freedom to all of us. Yeah. Uh, we will remember this few years from now, we will remember this. Yeah. Um, and he said, hijab is a symbol of suppression, of fellowship, that you are not fully human being. You are nothing without male guardian. You have to follow him and he will tell you why Egyptian ladies this hijab made their life disaster. They made them after the uh, harp, the war of um, 67, I think 67, and I think what, this is what you and um, talk about uh, this war. When uh, uh, this Arabic armies lost the war, in um, 1967, uh, those Salafis and uh, Ikhwan Muslimin started to say that we lost the war because of what women are wearing. This is what I want you to understand. And it was the brainwashing of that uh, our ladies wearing what they want and we are, the, uh, they wear uh, many skirts and like that and uh, uh, sleeveless uh, dresses. This was in Egypt. And they shamed women for what they wear and made them, not because the, uh, they cannot blame, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the fighters the men the yeah right yeah. <laughs> the ladies <laughs> what they are wearing and like that it was something silly and stupid and see how made egyptian ladies in such a position egyptians weren't like that we are among of this arabic speaking uh, societies Egyptians weren't like that. We do not deserve to be in such situation. But when they allow this Islamic people to flow over all over Egypt, all over the media, and they made them brainwash everybody, the ladies became boom, the situation of the ladies. All of them wore hijab, including my mother. My mother, she was against it. And she wore it. Also, she wore it. It is about our value. We, they made us valueless. You are nothing. You are, and I agree with you, Yasmin. Whatever you will do, whatever you will do, as a Muslim girl, it is not enough. Mm -hmm. It is not enough. Mm -hmm. They will make you feel shame for every single thing, for I look. Mm -hmm. They will make you shameful. Father, oh, I swear to you all, my mom would say to me, don't breathe. Don't take such a deep breath. You're sticking your breasts out. Oh. Breathing. <laughs> Breathing, yeah, Ines. It's I, not an exaggeration. I, Nothing yes, that we yeah. do. Yeah. Your abaya isn't, I, your abaya is too tight. I can see you breathing. Oh, yeah. Imagine. Yes, yes, yes. That's what the word Arab is for, to make you feel shame. I, and uh, um, Yasmin uh, also interviewed um, this. Also, she's Palestinian. Uh, that yeah. uh, real, real uh, story of hummus. Nada. Or the yeah. life of Muslim girl, or not Muslim girl only. I I, I can include Lena in this, and uh, not only Muslim yeah, girl. Yeah, but I think Lena will will be one of the first people to tell you that yes. it's extra for us yes, yes. 
there's a spectrum. I mean, it was the same for Lois as well, uh, being a fundamentalist Christian. She had a lot of these messages as well, but it's a spectrum. Yeah. Yes. 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 It is something. Yeah. You will never be enough. You will never. uh, Yeah. I mean, really fuck them all because you, uh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) even the love coming from this, uh, I, I don't want it. Uh, Yanni, yeah, uh, yeah. Th- thank you. Be away, stay away. <laughs> I don't <laughs> be loved by somebody like you, really. But that's what I think we all feel about this. And um, really, I'm so happy and proud of you. And uh, I'm so happy that you are such a young girl. Yeah. You are in the age of, uh, yeah, I mean, if I got uh, married very early, <laughs> my daughter will be in your age. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so happy to see Thank you. you and this. Thank you, Ismin. You are, yeah. you are making me actually, I mean, you have extra, um, uh, you, you know how much I love you. And oh. Uh, oh. yes, yeah, I mean, this you made me know Lena and Lois and uh, Alia and the Sahara. I love Sahara. <laughs> yeah, she's, well, she's Anya, favorite. Evo, everybody here. Yeah, and thank you, Lena. Thank you. We, we thank are family. You. We are we are haram infidel family, best family ever, guys. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you. Most, you can uh, say that we all here uh, love you and respect you so, so, so much. You, it was miraculous. What you did, mm-hmm. it was mu'ajiza. Mu'ajiza mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Well, we had a, a a large amount. We had 16 people join us today. And I want to make sure that everybody has had a chance to share their thoughts or ask their questions to Anne before I wrap up. We're good. Excellent. Okay, Anne, I want to give you the last word. So before I let you go today, um, are, are there any last final words that you want to say to us any advice that you want to share you've already shared so many meaningful things and so much good advice and i already know the clips that i'm going to take from this to share on social media that that you had one inspiring piece there that brought tears to my eyes um but just want to make sure that uh, that you have said everything that you need to say and shared everything that you want to share and if there's any lasting words you want to leave us with please the floor is yours Thank you. I think um, more than anything, I, I recognize I'm fortunate to be, you know, in the position that I'm in to have left to have left when I did. And I really appreciate having an opportunity for the first time. And I think my entire life that I've ever spoken about everything I've talked about today. And I, for me, education time and time again had proved to be the source of my liberation. And I think whether it's getting you out of an arranged marriage or, you know, just expanding your capacity of understanding, it's important. And there's, it's limitless. You're capable of anything. And I think for anyone going through a similar thing, I want them to know that just because someone else doesn't value their life doesn't mean you should. You shouldn't. Mm Ah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Anne. That was beautiful. I'm so grateful to you. I love you. I'm so happy that I found you. You have inspired us all. You have made my heart feel so just swelling with pride today. And like Ines said, I am so happy to see that you're so young and you have your whole life ahead of you. And I'm so glad that you were able to get out so early before wasting your life trying to fill this empty void that as you said will never be filled uh you chose you i'm so proud of you 
<laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Enjoy your weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you.